computer and I just want to make sure I came back. Okay. Hi guys, welcome back to the Astro Imaging channel. Tonight's session is a great one. It's uh, with Jerry Rodriguez, a Q&A. And uh, remember, Q&A, that means you guys ask your questions and we will call them out to him and answer them. If you're on the YouTube side, then you can uh, just type it into the Q&A app. We have an app for that. Um, before I do jump into that, I want to show off our image of the week, which actually goes to Anna Morris, who's going to be on in a couple weeks uh, to um, talk about her tools, uh, among other things. But uh, this is a great image of the bubble nebula, and I am hoping to find the, the uh, description, but I don't know if we had a description associated with this. Josh, do you remember whether uh, she posted a description on this? <laughs> Having trouble getting there. <laughs> here we go, here we go, here we go. I actually don't see the description, so I am just going to show up the bubble nebula, and it's a beautiful object. In a couple weeks, she's going to be back with us, and I will ask her about it. Uh, I'll be sure to. Adam, um, I can I can read it really quickly for you. Oh, <laughs> if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, I I couldn't find it. So just from her description on Cloudy Nights about the picture, she says, it seems I have had less and less time to image over the past year than I thought I would, mainly due to a new house location surrounded by trees and having to pack up and travel to do any imaging. She's gone to a few star parties and will have to make sure to use more, uh, make more use of those over the next year. But in addition, she's found a relatively dark sky location not far from home and went to spend the night to image there anytime she went. <clears throat> Her SQM readings there are 20.74 on a mostly cloudy night with reflecting local villages. And she hopes to get out on a completely clear night soon to take the proper readings. Uh, she finally took the guy up on his offer to go to that site to take the picture and did some imaging as um, <laughs> she said, as all of her boxes developed quite the layer of dust from lack of use and she found that unacceptable so she was ready to go out. Um, it ended up being partly to mostly cloudy almost the entire evening but the target had, she had picked, the bubble nebula, happened to be in one of the few stable holes in the clouds for a good portion of the night. Uh, it was made of three hours of HA and 1.5 hours of O3 before the clouds took over for the rest of the night. <clears throat> this was even this, even though less than what I would normally shoot on a nebula, was enough of, with the three nanometer Astrodon filters to turn out a pretty decent bicolor image. She would have loved to get some S2 to make a full narrow band, but even without that, she's quite pleased with how it came out, considering the lack of imaging time she's put in over the last year. Um, this was taken with an Orion Eon 80 ED, uh, ATIC 314L plus camera with a three nanometer HA and O3 Astrodon filters. Uh, processed in Photoshop CC with four and a half hours of total integration time. Thank you, Josh. That is a great image, and I you should check it out uh, outside the check it out on our page because there's a lot of detail there in the uh, between the bubble and the outer H alpha nebula uh, worth looking at close up. Um, one thing before I go over to Jerry, but uh, I don't know if you've seen it. We are now on Facebook, so if Google Plus is uncomfortable to you, but you want to get us on the social network, uh, you can get us on Facebook. As well, um, we are offering some t-shirts. Uh, we are trying to come up with a better presence both online and offline at some star parties. And uh, if you guys contribute uh, for a contribution of $35, we will send you an awesome Astro Imaging Channel t-shirt. Uh, and G I think, is that it on your screen, Josh? That might be it on his screen right there. I saw it for a second. This is it on my screen, and um, we're actually doing it for $30 for the first T-shirt, including shipping, and $25 for any additional T-shirts. There you go. I was trying to overcharge you. Um, but, yeah, awesome T-shirts. And uh, as well, if you present for us, you might get one in the mail. In fact, you will get one in the mail. Uh, but that's just uh, going to help us come up with a better presence at star parties, and we're working on our website. We're going to have that rolled out pretty soon, we hope. Uh, it's going to be awesome, but it's definitely taken longer than we would have liked, but it's just the way it is, quality over speed. 
Uh, and right now, I'm going to jump right over to Jerry, and Jerry's in the room. And uh, hi, Jerry. How are you doing? I'm going to take my camera back. Good. How are you guys doing? We are doing well. So thanks for coming by. Um, I know you have been doing this for a while. Uh, your website, Astropix, and uh, your DVD, your books on DVD are uh, great resources. And uh, people, if I, I'm sure some people are familiar, but if you're not familiar, check out his website and his books are well worth it. Um, before I uh, jump in, though, Jerry, would you mind giving us a bit of a background, uh, both astrophotography or and in general? Sure. I uh, started uh, when I was in uh, college and uh, bought a telescope and uh, brought a camera to take pictures through the telescope, but it was cloudy all the time, so I uh, started taking pictures of other stuff, and uh, I started taking some sports pictures, and uh, I figured out what a great hustle that was to uh, get into sporting events for free, um, and uh, not only that, but they would pay me to go. So uh, that was back in the day when, when men were men and they didn't have autofocus cameras and it was a real skill to be able to follow focus with a 300 millimeter lens when somebody threw the ball down the field. Um, but, uh, you know, I hooked the camera up to the telescope and started taking pictures. That was probably about almost 40 years ago now and uh, I've been doing it ever since. I quit taking sports pictures about six years ago when I retired from the Enquirer. Um, they were getting ready to go bankrupt so it was time to get out. And I've been writing books and uh, doing this full time ever since. Great, thank you. Um, so, uh, 40 years. I was going My next question for you. And remember, guys out there, I see there's a lot of people in the room now. Uh, type your questions into Q and A. This isn't just about me. This is about you guys getting your answers question. Uh, your questions answered. Um, and I actually uh, saw one pop up. And Josh, that's. A great question. I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of lead into that. Um, I was gonna ask you how has the hobby progressed since you began, but in 40 years, I'm sure the jump from film to di to digital and manual focus, although we're a lot of us are still using manual focus, kind of changed things. But oh, now Josh's question disappeared. But uh, uh, do you have any thoughts on the current DSLR market? Uh, Sony, Nikon, versus Canon, um, specs, but support. Go ahead. Yeah, well, the biggest change has been from film to digital. And when I first started out in digital, I was one of the first early adopters um, at the newspaper. And when I worked at the newspaper, it was a great hustle because they gave me all the cameras. I mean, I didn't get to keep them, but I got to use them, and it was always the latest and the greatest. So um, we started out with the Nikon D1, which was actually an awful camera and uh, it was not a big chip and it didn't have a lot of pixels in it and it had a lot of noise and uh, it was really pulling teeth with that because the autofocus didn't work but uh, you know I, I tried it for astrophotography and uh, you know that, that was back when I was so ignorant about digital I didn't even know what a dark frame was so I didn't get very good results with it because it had really high noise and a lot of thermal signal in it you know, since then, that's almost 15 years ago now, um, the cameras have gotten so incredibly good. It's really like uh, like a license to steal um, with how good these cameras are these days. So that's the biggest change that I've seen. Um, you know, uh, autofocus cameras now are really good for daytime stuff, but uh, they don't work that great for astrophotography unless you've got a really big fast lens like a 300 28 or something like that, and you put it on a bright star, you might be able to get it to focus, but it's just so easy. To focus now with live view. There's no real reason to try to even use autofocus on a camera for astronomical photography. And then if you get more sophisticated with you know some of the higher end telescopes you can get uh, motorized focuses and then there's software that'll let you focus that stuff too automatically. So uh, it just depends on how much you know how deep you want to get into it and how much money you want to spend and how complicated you want to make it. So Adam, I'm seeing you on the screen right now. Is 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 everybody seeing what I'm seeing here? Um, everybody's everybody is actually seeing you right now, uh, but now when I talk, it should jump over to me. Uh, whoever's talking is who they see. Okay, so I'm not seeing what everybody else is seeing. Uh, if you click, um, let me think. You click my name, 
or you click that white box, uh, click my avatar or whatever you see right now, um, and it should... A new full screen. Hmm. If you click, there's a white box around that, and it should just show you, uh, you have a choice of picking who you click, uh, clicking on who you want to see. But if you click that person again, it only it should go to whoever's speaking. Okay, I see it now. All right, so I clicked on me, and now... You should see it now. Hmm, okay. Okay. I'm yep. sorry. I'm just confused. No, no problem. It, it, it's a little confusing. Um, I can yeah. I confuse very easily. <laughs> yeah, DSLRs have come a long way. Um, I'm, I was going to ask you about misconceptions, but I'm going to put some words in your mouth here. Uh, I was going to ask you about beginner misconceptions and uh, what, what things people do wrong right off the bat frequently. But uh, I'm going to throw another thing in there. Should, should someone buy the best camera they possibly can, the best DSLR they possibly can, or should they be happy with a starter model? Well, if you've already got one, then that's the one you want to start out using. And if you don't have one, you, you don't have to go out and buy the best thing that's out there because the best thing that's out there now is a you know, $4,000 Nikon D810A, which is, to me, a, a ridiculous amount of money when you can get you know, 75% to 80% of the performance of that camera at a much lower price point for a couple of hundred dollars. You can get a a Canon refurb like a T3i, or they probably don't even have that available anymore, but a T5i for four or five hundred dollars. Uh, if you keep keep an eye out and look for the sales, you can get one maybe for three hundred dollars. You know, so this, to me, if you're just starting out, it, it's just crazy to go spend that much money because you don't know whether you're going to like this hobby or not once you're in it for six months or a year. So I would never advise anybody who's just getting started to go out and just buy the best stuff that they can buy. Um, I would I I would always get started with the cheapest stuff that you can buy and see if you like it, and then if you go crazy about it, and you want to devote your life to it, then you can go out and spend the money on it. Yeah, and I don't know I don't know if that was uh, one of the things on your website. But that was one of the things that I took from it. You you were more of a proponent of just what you have, and you don't have to go out and go crazy at first. No. Uh, no, you definitely don't. And, you know, as far as the technology, the technology today is really good. Everybody's got really good cameras out there. Um, everybody is, seems to be in love with the Sony sensors right now, but the Sony cameras have, you know, some problems with them because they're um, not putting out true raw files. So if you want to get into serious stuff like calibrating the files from them, you're going to have problems doing that. Um, even Nikons up until the, this last Nikon that just came out, the D810A, um, we're, we're doing a lot of funny stuff to the, to the raw files, and you couldn't calibrate them correctly. You couldn't you couldn't use flats and stuff like that. So those cameras had a lot of problems. Um, they had the notorious quote unquote star eater algorithm, which was a noise reduction algorithm, which would um, just delete uh, f tiny faint stars because it thought that was hot a thermal signal, hot pixels. So it would it would blur them out of existence. So um, until this last Nikon. They finally have entered the astrophotography market on a really serious basis um, and had a really high price point, too. Um, the Canons never had that problem, which is why everybody was using Canons for a really long time. Um, looks like Nikon's in the game now. The Sonys are still problematic. Um, I don't know a lot about many of the other cameras. There's not a whole lot of people out there using them uh, for astrophotography that I know of. Now, if you just want to shoot snapshots, and just go out there and shoot like wide-angle Milky Way on a fixed tripod, on an iPod, on an iOptron tracker, and stack a couple of images, not get real sophisticated, don't shoot dark frames and all of that stuff, then any of these cameras will work for you. Yeah. Um, I'm going to give you a tough one right now. Do you have a specific camera telescope mount that you re recommend for newcomers? Uh, I don't recommend jumping directly into a mount for new newcomers. I recommend you start out with your camera that you have with the lens that you have on a fixed tripod. And you don't even need a fixed tripod. You can use a bag of rice and stick it on top of your car and aim it at the sky and use the self-timer to trip the shutter so you don't touch it. You, you literally don't need any accessories. You can get started just shooting constellation pictures with a wide angle and, and get to learn how important the importance of exposure and focus is, uh, the two fundamentals. And, um, and then shoot that for a while until you, you learn how to focus. 
and uh, and then you can move up to a little bit more sophisticated stuff like making a homemade barn door tracker that you can make for fifteen dollars and I've got the instructions on my website on how to make one believe me if I can make one anybody can make one and um, and then you can start getting into some some tracked images where you align the barn door tracker on the North Pole North Celestial Pole and uh, and you can shoot uh, exposures up to a couple of minutes long and then you can you know shoot a couple of those and, and, and start learning how to how to stack with freeware like Deep Sky Stacker and then do that for another six months until you master that and then maybe start shooting with a little bit longer lenses on the, on the barn door tracker like a 50 millimeter lens instead of just a real wide angle and then as you as you progress on that you're going to progress in the level of difficulty too you're going to learn what's going on and how to do it and then you'll be ready to move up to a small refractor which is what I recommend um, a lot of people the biggest mistake that a lot of people make is they 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 jump in try to try to jump into it with a big old 10 inch um, SCT and that's a recipe for disaster um, they're going to be discouraged because it's so incredibly difficult to do it. They are usually on an altazimuth mount that's not going to track the sky. They're going to get field rotation in long exposures. Um, they're going to shoot at f10. They're going to be magnified at 2,000 millimeters of focal length or 3,000. It's going to magnify every little error that they make. Um, so it's extremely difficult to jump in to the deep end of the pool like that with that kind of equipment. Um, I, I recommend getting started really simply. Just a small you know 80 millimeter refractor on a decent mount I wouldn't buy the cheapest mount there's a lot of really bad cheap mounts out there um, you're gonna have to spend a little bit of money I mean it's like anything else but if you if you just go get by the cheapest $500 mount that you can find um, it's not gonna work good you're gonna get frustrated and you're gonna give it up and it's gonna be $500 that's wasted so save your money and buy something a little bit better than that um, you know the, the bottom of the line that I really recommend is something like the, the Orion Sirius mount I think it's around twelve hundred dollars but you know it's capable of doing a lot of things it's, it's got go to built into it you can hook a computer up to it um, so that's what I recommend get started real simple camera on a tripod advance to a barn door tracker then maybe even get an ioptron a little ioptron sky tracker um, it'll let you shoot longer exposures and uh, those are inexpensive, relatively inexpensive, about $300. And then finally, if you decide you really want to pursue this, then get into a, a mount that's going to cost you a good bit of money. I mean, everything is relative, but to me, you know, $1,000 is a lot of money. Yep. Is that a sky tracker I see over your shoulder? And that's the iOptron uh, sky tracker, yeah. Yeah, definitely a good way to start. Yeah. Um, Question from Q&A. What about the Pentax with virtual tracking? And I know you said you don't know much about these. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I, I've, I've seen it and heard about it, and it seems like a really nice little trick that they're doing there. And, uh, if, if, you know, if you've got one already, um, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, going to be a lot of fun to play with, and uh, you probably should be able to get some decent results with it. Um, but uh, it's not going to be a camera that you're going to, be able to use that particular feature with when you get into longer focal lengths like if you want to shoot through a telescope it's not going to help you for that so then you're just back to square one with all of the other stuff that you're going to need to do um, so if you've got one already then yeah definitely play with it and I'll assume that's a more expensive camera to begin with so I, I have no idea how much that camera cost oh another question from Q&A how do you think Canon will respond to the new Nikon? Well, you know, Canon already had two of those cameras out there. They had the 20DA from a long time ago, from 10 years ago, and uh, they just came out with the 60DA. Um, but Nikon really went after the high end of the market there for with a $4,000 camera, and it's it's a really good camera. I, I'd say it's state of the art right now. It's probably the lowest noise camera out there, but. The other thing I personally think that there's a little bit of a misconception about is I, I hear people just absolutely raving about these Sony sensors, and that's what Nikon is using in these cameras is a Sony sensor, and they're really good, don't get me wrong, but they're not an order of magnitude better than anything else out there. My example is that if you go out and buy a car, you buy a Toyota, or you buy a Honda, they're both good, just like the Canon and the Nikons are. Um, but they're not, one is just not incredibly better than the other one, right? 
you know, Toyotas and Hondas, they're, they're, they're both pretty good, okay? And, you know, as the technology changes, one of them will leapfrog ahead of the other one a little bit. Um, that's what's happening with the DSLR cameras. Um, the Sony sensors are really good right now. They're definitely better, but I've looked at the true RAW files, and uh, a lot of the stuff that you, you see on the daylight um, uh, photography websites, um, they test the stuff and they compare it, but they, they do all kinds of stuff to the RAW files. Like they run them through a RAW converter, and those things have special profiles applied to them, and then they compare like a Canon to a Nikon. But that's not a fair comparison because they're not being processed exactly the same. I've taken the RAW files from the Canon, the top of the line Canon for astrophotography, which is the 6D right now, or possibly the 7D Mark II. But I've taken the 6D files and I've compared them to the Nikon files, and the Nikons are a little bit better. They're maybe 10% better, but the Nikon cost four times as much. So you're paying a lot for that last little bit of performance there to get the state of the art. The problem with paying $4,000 for a camera is that two years from now, the technology is going to be not obsolete, but there's going to be a newer and greater camera come along. So it's a lot of money to invest $4,000 today to get the best, you know, and it's, you know, I mean, it'll last you for a long time. It'll last you for two or three years at least before you want a new one. But um, anyway, I, I don't think that that, that that technology is, like, ridiculously better. Like, if you have already got a Canon system, to switch it over and go buy all of the Nikon stuff. But, you know, I guess it just depends on how much money you got to spend. Well, actually, I think that's where a lot of us are coming from is uh, we do, we're, we're more Canon-centric. And we have our lenses, and we have our stuff, and we'd be switching if we went to a Nikon. Uh, so we kind of are pulling for Canon. We're saying, "Hey, Canon, uh, they're ten percent better. Up at ten percent on the next model, so we could buy your next model, and we don't have to defend Canons on the forums." Well, you uh, know, it's such such a bizarre thing with this astrophotography specific cameras because. Um, you know, the rumors were that Canon, the reason Canon came out with those because, was because, like, the president of the company happened to be interested in astrophotography. And, like, that market share compared to all of the other DSLRs that they're selling is really small. Like, Canon hardly made any 20 DAs. I mean, it was a tiny number that they made. I don't know how many of the 60 DAs that they made, and I don't know how many of the, the, eight, the DA-10As that, that, that Nikon's making, but that's a tiny market share. Um... I don't know whether they're doing it for prestige or because Nikon feels like, well, Canon's got one. We had to come out with one. But, I mean, honestly, if you if you go on places like Cloudy Nights and every once in a while people will put out like a wish list for what they want in a DSLR camera for astrophotography. And they want all kinds of crazy stuff like they want cooling in there, yeah. like, a DSLR, like a CCD camera. And I, I'm thinking like, look, man, if you want a cool camera, just go buy a cool CCD camera. But the problem is, is that they want all of that stuff at a price point for what the DSLRs are. They want a cooled, astronomical DSLR for $500 yeah. or $1,000, and that's not going to happen. Um, the only reason that Canon and Nikon can make these cameras, quote, unquote, unquote, for astrophotography is because on the production line, all they've got to do is change the filter, the long wavelength filter in front of the sensor. And it's a tiny thing for them to do. But if you talk about all of this other stuff that people want in there, like built-in dark frame, well, I mean, you've kind of got that now on a single frame basis, but um, all of that other stuff that people want in there, cool, especially cooled, i got to laugh at that, um, that stuff is just not going to happen because they would have to create an entire new production line and they're only making 1,000 cameras. I'm just making that number up, but, you know, like they're making a million cameras on the other ones, and if they're only making 1,000 or 10,000 astronomical cameras, it's just not economically viable for them to do that. So you're basically never going to see that. You're just going to keep seeing, this is my personal opinion, but um, I think you're just going to keep seeing what you see now, which is just the modified cameras with the, with the long wavelength filter modified. And if it's in a good low noise camera, I mean, that's great. You know, it's almost to the point where you kind of don't need cooling anymore. I mean, the thermal signal in these new cameras is so low that a lot of people are not even shooting darks anymore. And that was actually a question that popped up a few questions earlier. Uh, what do you think of the dark, no darks movement? Well, you know, it's interesting. It's interesting, and, and it's definitely viable, and you can do it now. If you have one of those new low-noise cameras with the low thermal signal, one of the latest generation cameras, 
you, you can probably get away with it, but you, you kind of really need to do dithering, which is an advanced technique where you move the frame slightly in between images so that the, 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 the pattern noise doesn't uh, reinforce itself, so that that cancels itself out. And um, you got to do dithering. You got to shoot a lot of frames. You got to use sophisticated noise rejection algorithms to stack the images, like Sigma, Sigma meet, um, you know, and stuff like that. Um, so uh, it, it's, uh, I'm not, it's not really a kind of a beginner's technique. Um, you know, it's, it's not a lot of trouble to shoot some darks in your garage at night. I mean, I've created the dark frame library at about every 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, shoot a bunch of darks on a cloudy night and just keep a, keep a library of darks. It's, it's not hard to do that. And um, again, is the problem is if you're just getting started, um, you can get away with murder, really. You know, but it's, it's when you want to start pushing the envelope and getting the most out of what you can do. And I'm not sure that that technique is definitely not going to be better than, than calibrating with real dark frames. But it's certainly a viable technique on these new cameras. The problem is the price point on those cameras. You know, the, the, the 6D now has dropped down. I mean, I think you can get them for about $1,200 now. So that's becoming more affordable, but my price range is <laughs> three or $400. So those cameras are not down there yet. Um, question from Q&A. How much better is a full frame over a CMOS? Uh, over CMOS. I'm assuming he meant full frame over a... Uh, APS-C chip? Well, the full-frame cameras are, are terrific. They're, in general, you know, that's the higher-end stuff where the camera manufacturers are putting in the, the best technology. Um, the, the theory used to be that the full-frame cameras had bigger pixels. Bigger pixels could collect more photons, so you had a better signal-to-noise ratio. But it's much more complicated than that because you could also consider that for a given area of, of the sensor, however big your sensor is, the same number of photons are falling on it, um, no matter how big the pixels are. So the total number of photons being recorded are the same. So you don't really suffer that much of a signal-to-noise hit by having smaller pixels. Um, you do have the read noise from more pixels involved, but once you're up above, and this is really advanced stuff now, this is not beginner stuff, okay, but once you've got your exposure up above the, the readout noise and you're into the sky fog regime, um, that readout noise per pixel doesn't really matter that much. So the size of the pixels don't matter. I personally think that's a big misconception, and I had it too for a long time. But I've read stuff by people who are a lot smarter than me um, who say that it doesn't matter anymore. Um, the technology in these cameras is so good nowadays that the size of the pixels don't matter. So what you're getting into, the only difference between a full-frame camera and an APS-C size camera now is the size of the field of view that you've got at a given focal length. So 100 millimeters of focal length is 100 millimeters of focal length, and that's going to give you a particular image scale. And uh, a full-frame sensor is going to give you a wider field of view at the same image scale than an APS-C sensor does. So it's good if you want wider fields of view, but you really pay a steep price. And that price is that you have to have much better optics because the performance in the corners of the field is really a killer. It's much more difficult to get good performance in the corner of the field of t camera lenses especially, but telescopes also. So a lot of telescopes won't cover a full-frame camera. Um, so you get into additional cost in that you need really high-end optics to cover full-frame cameras, and you need really expensive top-of-the-line lenses and you need uh, full-frame field flatteners. Like, I have a top-of-the-line top telescope. I've got an astrophysics refractor. And I tried out this, this, I did a, I'm doing a review of the Nikon DA-10A for uh, Sky and Telescope, and I tried, that's a full-frame camera. And I, I used that on my astrophysics refractor, and the astrophysics refractor is certainly capable of covering that entire frame. But, Almost all refractors, unless they're specially made with like a Petzval design or something, are going to have a curved feel. And um, when you're talking about using a, a field flattener, which you pretty much have to do, um, to cover a full-frame camera, um, I got a lot of vignetting. And I talked to Astrophysics about it, and they said, well, yeah, we, you know, we weren't making them to cover full-frame cameras before. Now we're going to design a new field flattener to cover full-frame cameras and larger because some of the CCD cameras are even bigger than that now. 
Um, but uh, you know, you're gonna have to buy that the new full frame field flattener. It's probably gonna cost you know eight hundred dollars or more. And but the killer about it is it doesn't fit in the old focuser. It doesn't fit in the Astrophysics 2.7 inch focuser. You have to buy a new focuser for it too, which is gonna double your cost. So you're talking about you know the the, the refracted I've got is six six thousand five hundred dollars. You're talking about adding another two thousand dollars to the cost of that to to be able to shoot with a full frame camera that cost four thousand dollars. So you're doubling your cost in in your telescope by going to a full frame camera. So that to me is the is the biggest difference between a full frame camera and an APS C size sensor. Great points. Yeah. It's very expensive to illuminate a full frame sensor. If you have all the money in the world, then buy a full frame. Uh, definitely an expensive proposition. And then you get uh, into tilt, which can also make it a little bit more difficult. I'm sorry, I'm just trying to talk as I read through. So, sure. um, uh, I heard you have an astrophysics refractor. What? Uh, tell us about your gear. What What are you shooting with? I've got a uh, five inch. Astrophysics refractor. That's uh, I use an Astrotech AT65 EDQ, which is a four-element flat field, uh, tiny 65 millimeter refractor, but it's really got nice performance on it. And I use that as a guide scope and to shoot wider fields. Uh, piggyback on top, and I use a Lodestar auto guider. Um, I had a Takahashi mount that I sold and I bought a Paramount MYT which I've been using for nine months now, which unfortunately has been giving me nothing but nightmares. Mm, interesting. Um, Josh is uh, asking if you plan on expanding your guide to, deep, uh, guide to the deep sky with more targets. He's saying it's his favorite source for image selection, but doesn't, doesn't cover a lot of the targets he'd like to shoot that are less common. Well, I have. <laughs> I'm trying to complete my, my Messier uh, list, which uh, you'd think after 40 years I would have shot every Messier object, but I haven't, uh, because I would always go after you know the more spectacular stuff, like some of the small globules in Sagittarius, and not too thrilling um, photographically. Um, but I finally finished that, so I'll probably be adding that stuff in an update. Um, you know, the the, the fainter targets. Um, I, I have honestly pretty much exhausted what I can shoot with a DSLR in terms of faint stuff and obscure stuff. The trouble with the obscure stuff is it's faint. And when you look on, on the internet and you see these beautiful images of, of this really faint, dusty stuff like the, uh, you know, the inter intergalactic flux nebula, and um, you see that stuff in a shot with CCD cameras from places out in Arizona with guys are putting 30 hours of exposure into that, well, you know, their skies are at least a magnitude darker than my skies, so that's 2.5 times more exposure that I would need. So you multiply 30 hours by 2.5, you get what 75 hours worth of exposure that I would need with a DSLR. And then there's the sensitivity difference between the CCD and the DSLR, probably double that again. So those guys out there are shooting that faint stuff with a DSLR in Arizona and shooting 30 hour exposures. I don't have 150 clear hours in a year here. To shoot that stuff, so um, I'm probably at the limit of what I'm going to be able to put into that book in terms of obscure faint objects. And you're, uh, I believe, I believe in, in, in uh, New Jersey. Jersey. Yeah, yeah. You, you get the same weather as I as I do. How's your light pollution there? Well, I, I, we have the pine barrens here, so um, we we do have a little bit of a a dark sky area where it's not open to development. And my uh, sky quality meter readings, uh, usually at, on a good night at the best I've ever seen here, has been about 20.78. Now that compares to, say, Cherry Springs, um, which is the, one of the dark, used to be one of the darkest places on the East Coast. Up there on a really good night at solar minimum, it would be about 21.75, so about a full magnitude darker. And there's pretty much no place darker on the East Coast except for possibly Spruce Knob. But it's not going to get that much darker than 21.78 or 21.8. Um, you you got to go someplace crazy to get darker than that, like Chile. Um, so it's reasonably dark, but there's a ton of light pollution from Philadelphia here that I've got in the Northwest. 
Um, that's sky quality meter readings for overhead. Um, so it's the best that I can do without a six hour drive up to Cherry Springs. And to put it into perspective, I could get on a plane and fly to Arizona in six hours. Yeah. Yeah, I know uh, it's tough finding dark skies around here. Spruce Knob, West Virginia, that uh, a trip to West Virginia got me into astronomy. Just looking up and seeing the dark skies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially when you can when you get someplace dark. Yeah, Most yeah. people don't see that anymore. It was shocking to me. I came back, I had to buy a telescope. <laughs> um, what program do you use for acquisition and processing? Um, you broke up a little bit. I'm assuming you're asking what do I use for acquisition and processing? Yes. yes. Yeah. I use Backyard EOS to control my uh, Canon DSLR, and I used uh, uh, Guy Lan uh, Roshan, who wrote the program, was nice enough to give me a beta copy of Backyard Nikon that supported the uh, Nikon D810A so that I could test it. And so I, I really love that program. Um, it's just awesome uh, to control the camera. And it can do it. I mean, it just does so much. If you want to shoot planetary, you can you can do that with it too. Um, that's a done the subject. But um, you know, you need to if you want to do high resolution planetary, you really need to capture one to one pixel resolution off those chips. And the only way to do that is by uh, recording live view. And Backyard EOS will do that. A lot of people think that you need to record high definition video with those cameras, but that's not the way to do it because high definition video really trashes the resolution. So if you, you need to, to crop that sensor down to one-to-one -to, -one to get um, high definition, to get true high definition off of it, but that's a, a, an advanced technique for planetary photography. But I use Backyard Nikon um, to acquire the images. And, uh, you know, in, it, it interfaces with PHD2, which I use for auto-guiding my, with my Lodestar. And it'll do dithering. Uh, it'll interface real nicely. It'll stop the exposures and let, it, let the, uh, the mount dither in between exposures. Um, and then I, uh, for image processing, I use Images Plus to calibrate uh, my images and uh, align and stack them. And then I take them into Photoshop and I do everything else in Photoshop. Although I, I, I have used Deep Sky Stacker, and uh, that works really well considering the fact that it's free. Um, and I may be having a book coming out about that soon, maybe. A little surprise, maybe. Um, so that's what I use, Backyard, Backyard EOS, PHD2, and uh, Images Plus, and Photoshop. We'll keep our eyes on that book. Where do you see the hobby going? The technology is getting so good. I'll leave it general. Yeah, the technology is really good right now. And, you know, um, I've been saying this for a couple of years now, but the cameras are so good that it's the camera is not a limitation anymore. The limitation is, honestly, is the skill of the photographer who's using it. I guess maybe you could say that since the history of photography, <laughs> it's always been, you know, the skill of the photographer who's using the technology. Um I mean, I don't know how much better they can make this stuff. You know, the noise, they've got the readout noise so low on these DSLRs, and they've got the thermal signals controlled really good now. You're not going to see leaps and bounds, orders of magnitude improvement in these cameras anymore. Um, you're going to see things like, uh, I'm betting that um, in the next five years, it'll everybody will switch over to the mirrorless cameras um, because uh, it'll just be the next new quote-unquote greatest thing to use. And, you know, and the sensors may get incrementally better. Um, if they start using this uh, back-illuminated back -illuminated technology that some new camera just came out with, I mean, I think that you know, the, the, the technology seems to be coming out first now in the phones, and then it, it migrates upwards. Um, somebody's got a DSLR out now with a back-illuminated sensor, which is what the really high-end CCD cameras had. Um, so that stuff will trickle down, and that'll be you'll see incremental improvements in the in, in the quantum efficiency of these cameras. Um, so they'll they'll improve that stuff, but you know I don't know how much more they're going to be able to improve stuff like the micro lenses and the filters. Uh, if you're using a one-shot color camera with the Bayer filters, you know, you know I mean 
that stuff is just going to be all incremental improvements. So to me right now, the technology is really good. The limitation is the photographer and how much time he's willing to put into it. Sony's A7R2 is the back illuminated sensor. Okay. Yeah. So, you yeah, know, it's going to be fun to play with it. If Sony quits trashing the raw files, it'll be great. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's, that's a big problem. problem. And, and, and Nikon a little bit better. I'm sorry, I'm hearing an echo on myself. I hope you'll be hearing yeah, uh, You're breaking up a little bit. I'm, I'm going to mute you for one second. Yeah. Here we go. I'm sorry for that. Uh, yeah, uh, Sony, I believe, uh, or Nikon preserves the raw files a little bit better. The way uh, they they store them in is it 14 bit or 16 bit? I'm not quite sure, but Sony doesn't quite do it that way. Is the way I've heard it. So you do a little bit better with Nikon using the Sony sensors. Uh, we can all hope that Canon starts using Sony sensors if they don't have a big boost. But they're so good. It's like you said. It's it's 10 percent we're talking about. And trying to unmute you now. And what did I do here? What did I do here? Let me try. Oh, I had a button. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. Can you hear me? Yep, yep. Okay. Yeah, the Nikon's. I think uh, don't trash the raw files like uh, like Sony's. Uh, Sony was doing it, and um, uh, Canon. You know, uh, the truth of the matter is that all of these manufacturers are not really giving you true raw data. Every one of them is messing around with that raw data, and subtracting the thermal signal and, and all kinds of stuff like that uh, before they write the raw file. The Canons were much better when you got into calibration and stuff like that. And the Nikons were problematic until recently, and uh, the Sonys were really problematic. Um, but, you know, maybe as they get better, they won't need to do it anymore. Um, they're all, you know, 14-bit cameras. Uh, none of them are 16-bits, but... The truth of the matter, too, with, six, with CCD cameras is you're not really getting 16 bits of true data in there either because the noise floor is, if the noise floor is three or four or five um, uh, electrons, then uh, you don't have 16 bits of data anyway. But they all just use 16-bit AD converters, so uh, there may be some advantage to doing that. But uh, there's not that much of disadvantage to having 14 bits in a DSLR now. This, this is a good talk from Josh. Uh, what do you use with DSLR? Would you, would you move with Swiss PD? I can't hardly understand you. I'm um, so sorry. We're going to do the same thing. Same thing. Um, you can probably hear me now, I think. Uh, why, uh, from Josh, why do you stick with DSLRs? Uh, if someone gave you a CCD, would you use it? Or are you just more of a DSLR guy? And now just give me one second. There you go. There you go. Yeah, hi, okay. Um, I stick with DSLRs because that's what I got into, and that's what my market is for the books, is people who use DSLRs. Um, CCDs are really high-end stuff. I could never afford them. If somebody gave me a $10,000 high-end CCD cameras, I'd be really tempted to use it. But uh, for the way that I make my living, which is selling the books on teaching people how to use DSLRs for astrophotography, um, I, I'm not sure at this point that I would want to uh, fragment my market there. Um, you know, there's, there's probably a hundred or more times people using DSLRs than CCD cameras. So for me, it's, it's just a business decision at this point, mostly. And it's also a financial decision in that I can't afford really high-end CCD cameras. Sorry, I'm just... Muting you real quick. We're going to do this back and forth. Uh, next question. Uh, Photoshop, uh, which do you prefer, Photoshop 6 versus Lightroom 6? And I'm trying to think, is that is that the option? Photoshop 6 versus Lightroom? Is Lightroom the... Well, I'm going to let you answer that. Well, Lightroom is a, is a program that combines a lot of different functionality, like um, in terms of uh, sorting images and... Uh, and tagging images and filing them and hitting thumbnails up there and uh, and and then you can get and then it gets into the processing too where for normal daytime images you can do a lot of work in, in Lightroom and you might not even need Photoshop. Um, I don't use Lightroom so I don't know a lot about it so I can't comment on it. 
Um, I, I grew up with Photoshop, so that's what my area of expertise is in. I'm sorry, the guys in, out in the room are complaining about an echo back and forth, so I'm going to go back and forth muting us, but hopefully I'll be able to take care of all that. Um, have you ever used a mirrorless camera for astrophotography? I have used a, an incredibly cheap point-and-shoot camera on a tripod, which didn't have a mirror in it. Does that count? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have not used any of the current generation high-end mirrorless cameras because the Canon ones have not been any good, to be perfectly honest about it. Um, I even heard the Canon reps talk poorly about the Canon EOS M which is the only one out there. I guess they just came out with the M3, which they were selling overseas. They weren't selling it here. Now they're going to start selling it here. I don't know. The problem with the Canon mirrorless was that um, you couldn't tether it and control it through a computer. So uh, I haven't used any of the other ones that are out there, the Nikons or the Sonys or anything like that. You know, they're basically not real different. I mean, the guts of the camera is pretty much the same. It's the same sensors. Um, they just don't have a mirror in them. So they're not that different to use from a, from a usability standpoint in terms of, you know, how much exposure you need. You can get into stacking and stuff like that. Um, I, I think that the technology is going to go more and more to the to the mirrorless cameras, though, um, and that they're going to start moving away from the DSLRs because it's, it's two things. It's that uh, you kind of don't need a mirror, really. I can't tell you the last time I looked through my optical viewfinder on my DSLR, for astrophotography. Um, so you kind of don't need a, a mirror to look through a view, an optical viewfinder if you're just going to look at the LCD on the back of the camera. And uh, so um, the other reason is financial for the manufacturers because, uh, to be blunt about it, if they can switch everybody over now who has a DSLR that's perfectly fine to make them think that they really need a mirrorless camera because it's so much better, then they, they can resell everybody a new camera. Yet, the one interesting thing is it's giving them a chance to rethink everything. And knowing what they know now, knowing what they can do with sensors now, um, they could do some cool stuff with mirrorless. From an astrophotography standpoint, though, they still seem to have locked it up. And uh, the, the tethering and the, the bulb timer makes it pretty difficult to work with. Um, okay. Um, Josh is asking, there's a, a, a lot of new processing techniques becoming prevalent. Um, oops, lost it again. Um, do you plan to start covering some of these in, the, in future books? And he's mentioning tone mapping as one. Uh, or are you still, do you, do you look at yourself as primarily aiming at newcomers and getting people interested in astrophotography? And give me one second to unmute you. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, um, the new technique that I'm probably going to cover in a future book is going to be what I call heuristic processing, which is um, you take the RAWs and you run them through the camera manufacturer's RAW processing program like uh, Canon's Digital Photo Professional or Nikon's. And uh, there's a lot, like the Nikon, the Nikon software now for the new DA10A had a feature in there to remove um, hot pixels. And it worked really good. Um, so you can shoot a bunch of RAWs, and you can just process one frame, adjust the contrast and the color, reduce the noise in it, and then apply those same adjustments to, to every frame. And then uh, just let it do a batch conversion, and then take all of those frames and stack them in a program like Deep Sky Stacker. And then uh, you know improve the signal-to-noise ratio by stacking. Uh, so it's a, it's a kind of a new workflow with... Um, not maybe having to shoot darks anymore. But if you've got weird illumination in your system, like you've got, a, say, a, you're using an off-axis guider and you've got a little bit of a mirror shadow in there, or you've got um, some vignetting and you want to get rid of that with flat field frames, you can get rid of some of the vignetting in this new software too. The trouble is, is that it doesn't really have profiles for vignetting on telescopes. It has profiles for vignetting with the camera lenses by the camera manufacturers if you're using a Nikon lens on a Nikon camera. If you're using something like a Rokinon on a Nikon camera, the Nikon software is not going to know what to do that 
with that. So, um, you know, there's a lot of benefits to, to doing it like that. But if you shoot with a telescope and you need flat flat frames, then you're not going to be able to use that kind of processing. So there's pluses and minuses to it. Um, so maybe um, something on uh, that kind of processing. You know, as far as tone mapping, I think tone mapping is a kind of a fancy name for something that we've pretty much been doing all along. Um, that's kind of for, for HDR guys, I think, mostly, um, who are doing, like, daytime photography and doing tone mapping. Um, some of the more sophisticated um, astrophotographers may be calling it that, but I'm honestly not sure it's that different than what we've been doing all along. Um, so I saw another question pop up there, but it disappeared. I'm not, did that answer the question? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. For, for, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to prevent the echo. Um, I think that, yeah, I think that answered the question a bit. Um, I, I'm not sure, I, you know, I, a lot of things to say there, and that question popped up. Um, so I think what you're talking about there is ACR camera processing, or, or similar to the Alice method, uh, which, which surprisingly becomes a controversial topic every so often. But um, I have to admit, I, I tried it. I was challenged to try it. I tried it, and uh, it gave me good results. It, was on, it wasn't on my data. It was on someone else's data. I didn't have any control over anything, but I knew their equipment, and it gave me good results. Uh, I couldn't give it a really great test, but uh, I think it gets into what we said earlier. You know, Sometimes you're talking about 2%. Sometimes you're talking about just a little bit, and in many cases, something that's easier works better because it's easier. Um, that question, though, that I want to jump over to is, uh, I'm sorry, uh, can you go into how to focus using a Nikon 5200 in live view? I can't ever seem to get sharp focus because I can't see the star in the LCD. And again, give me one second to unmute. Un yeah, sure. Um First of all, you gotta know, got to know a couple of things about Nikons. Now, I haven't used every Nikon that's out there, so uh, sort of some of the stuff I'm hearing from people who are familiar with the cameras. But my understanding is that uh, the Nikons before the D810A were the live view when you magnified it wasn't really one-to-one -one pixel resolution. It was interpolated pixel resolution, which really made the image blurry. And that's going to make it hard to focus. That's just a limitation of the Nikon's live view system. But there are a couple of techniques and tips for just using live view in general that you're going to want to use. You want to go to, you're going to want to, <laughs> you're going to want to use the brightest star that you can get in there. You're not going to be able to focus on any kind of faint deep sky objects. You're going to have to move the telescope or the camera lens and aim it at a bright star. And you're going to need to be close to focus to start with. You can't, um, oh, okay, I'll say the question about tone mapping. Yeah, we can get back to that. Um, you can't uh, focus, if you're way out of focus with either a lens or a telescope, nothing is going to show up in live view. So you have to be reasonably close to start with. And a way to do that is to simply look through the optical viewfinder at a bright star. And if you've got it in the field of view, you should be able to see that it's out of focus optically with your eye through the optical viewfinder. This is not in live view. And then just tweak it until it's close. But, but leave it there and then go in to live view. And it should be in the frame. You should be able to see it. And then um, kick the magnification up and, and focus it as best you can. Um, that's kind of the big secret to using live view. Um, you got to realize it's not going to show you faint stuff. You need pretty bright objects to start with. So um, the other problem with the Nikons, and I don't know what the cutoff point on this is, excuse me, but on the older models, it would only present an image that it thought was the correct exposure in live view. And if you change the exposure in the camera, it, it wouldn't really change to reflect that. Um, so that may enter into how focusing with live view works also in that 
if it's got if you got a you know just a single star and the, and the sky background is black, it's going to try to expose it so that the sky background looks correctly exposed. Although it's probably on a dark sky site, it's just going to run out of exposure that it can add to it, and you're not going to see much difference. So it, it may work, but um, that was my understanding on some of the older Nikon cameras, and I don't know how that specifically applies to the 5200. But um, the, the biggest things are use a bright star and get it close to focus to start with and then magnify it. You want to go back to that tone question? Yeah. yeah. Go okay, so uh, I saw uh, some, I don't know who it was, but somebody poked up a, a, a thing about talking about tone mapping being uh, separating the, the nebula background from the stars and then and processing them different. And yeah, um, People are using that technique in uh, the really advanced stuff like uh, like PixInsight, um, and Images Plus will do it too. Um, I, I just I, I can do it in Photoshop. It, it's a complicated process where you uh, you process an image and then you you take the stars out of it, and then you subtract that from from the, the original image, and then you get just just the nebulosity in the background, and you can work on the contrast and uh, and stuff like that so that you don't bloat the stars when you're increasing the contrast on the sky background and then you drop the stars back in and you can use that to, to maintain um, the color balance of the stars and the color saturation on the stars and it's a it's a sophisticated technique that it, it works really well it's it's pretty complicated I haven't gotten into PixInsight yet um, but I, I've been doing that in Photoshop for a while now um, if I ever do an advanced image processing book I'll probably cover stuff like that but the next book I think I'm thinking about doing is going to be a, a, a beginner's image processing book, because I just think there's a lot more people out there who are beginners who need need help on the basic stuff. You know, once you get into those advanced kind of techniques, um, you, you know, there's places you you can learn it. But there's not a lot of people out there who are that advanced, and uh, it's kind of the old like the Linux rule of thumb was that if somebody's using Linux, <laughs> they need to know how to rebuild the kernel and all of that stuff. So uh, anyway. Okay, question from Q&A. Um, do you know of a cheap and easy way to cool a T3i for summer heat? And I don't know. Maybe you, maybe you can take that wherever you'd like to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, stick it in your refrigerator. Oh, you mean you mean cooling it when you got it on a telescope? <laughs> I'm so stupid. Um, well, you can make a homemade cooler box for a reasonably inexpensive amount of money. Um, Gary Honus has a website where he talks about how to do it, and he's got a really good design. He takes you through it step by step. You build it with um, some styrofoam panels, and you hook up a, a tech cooler to the side of the box, and the whole box has to be enclosed, and you run into problems with moisture condensing inside the box, so you have to put the silica desiccant inside of it you have to make sure it's all closed up tight, and then moisture will condense on uh, the, the elements in the front, so you have to use some kind of uh, optical element to give you a window in there that you can heat so the moisture doesn't condense inside the camera. Uh, that's a problem for me where I shoot from because I always have a ridiculous amount of humidity here. If you're out in the desert, you might need, not need to do all of that stuff. You might need to cool it even more. Um, but that's the, 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 the inexpensive way to drop your temperature 20 or 30 degrees from whatever the ambient is. And it, work, it works well. I've got one. I use it when I'm shooting uh, narrow band hydrogen alpha in the summertime, and my exposures need to be like 15 minutes. Um, so you can, you can build one. Um, they, there were a couple of commercial models out there. Orion was selling one, but like a lot of Orion products, it didn't stay around for too long, and I didn't hear a lot of good things about it. Um, so you know, you might somebody else I think was making one. They were reasonably expensive, a couple of hundred, three, four hundred dollars. Um, that's a lot of money. You know, this is the same thing. There's some there's a line out there someplace. I won't call it a line in sand, but um, there's a line where when you want to start getting into cooling your camera and scraping off the bare color filters on there so you can shoot monochrome, 
and shooting narrow band, six nanometer wide hydrogen alpha images with a DSLR, it's really time to just go buy a CCD camera. Okay, guys? Um, there's always some people who like want to push that technology as, as much as they can. And, and I admire people who just want to bang their head against the wall like that. Um, but if you want to start cooling your camera and shooting narrow band, it's really time to get a, a monochrome CCD camera, okay? Um, unless you're just trying to do it as cheap as you can possibly do it, that's something to be said for that. In that case, then you want to build your own. Go to Gary Honus's website. It's H-O-N-I-S, G-A-R-Y, Gary Honus's website. He, he does the camera modifications, too. Um, and he's got a, a page about how to build a, a camera cooler for a DSLR. So that would be the way to go. Thank you. Uh, Josh is asking, are there any, nor and I, I see we're coming up on time, but uh, are there any northern targets that you haven't shot that you'd like to shoot? Targets. Yeah, we yeah. Go. yeah the, uh, the Flux Nebula. I've been shooting that for two years now, and I don't have enough data to put the image together yet. So uh, every time winter comes around, I shoot... Uh, the M81, M82 area uh, to get the integrated, I called it the intergalactic flux nebula before. Hmm, I think Me it's too. the integrated flux nebula. Me too. Yeah. So I've been shooting that. I got, I got like, I don't know, 30 or 40 hours worth of data on that, and I probably need at least twice that from my uh, location. So um, that's, you know, that stuff is kind of all over. Um, but I've, I've shot... A lot, uh, pretty much everything that I can shoot with the focal length that I have. My problem is there's a lot of little stuff that I'd like to shoot, planetary nebula, um, that I can't shoot because I had a C11 for a while and I tried shooting that stuff and I, I just don't have the scene in here in New Jersey. The jet stream is almost always overhead and I would not get any more resolution in my C11 deep sky images than I would get in my 5 inch images. So it just wasn't worth the trouble and the effort because it was a giant pain in the you-know-what to shoot with a C11 compared to a 5-inch refractor. Um, so there's the small stuff that I'd like to shoot, but I just don't have the, the, the uh, atmosphere here in terms of the scene to be able to do it. Yep, I've got my C8. I love my C8, but I'm beyond, uh, beyond the limits of my seeing here. So I always think that how much smaller could I go and not lose resolution, and it's probably a good bet. Um, but I see we've gone over our hour, and I, I do want to thank you, Jerry, for coming out. Uh, I don't know if you had anything you wanted to bring up before we go. I'm going to give you a couple if you, if you had anything. Had um, I can go longer if you want. Uh, that's, uh, if we still got questions. Yeah, right? yeah. Anyone, Anyone else, else have a question out there? there? Q&A. I, I'm sorry, I have to toggle back and forth between Q&A. Uh, if anyone out there in Q&A has uh, questions, please type them in now. Um, I uh, One thing I want to say, integrated flux nebula, there's a lot of it around Polaris, but that stuff's real tough to get. And that's that's my, uh, after Einstein's cross, that's my, probably my bucket list target. But um, oh. Uh -huh. Adam, Adam there's a question in QA about how CC back cover. Have you seen, seen that? that? I, I use CC back cover with my Canon T3i, I, available for Nikon also, usually three power magnification. Did you hear that, Jerry? No, I'm okay. I have to toggle but back and forth between the two panes. Uh, from Q uh, I use an LCD magnifier for focusing with my Canon T3i. They are available for Nikon also using a three times power magnifier. Yeah, so that's a good, uh, one of those little magnifying things. That's a good technique for being able to see the stars on your screen, on your LCD screen. Um, and uh, let's see here. Jerry, do you do workshops? 
and I'm going to have to unmute you. I do workshops up at usually up at Neef every year. I'm uh, doing a couple of. Uh, I have a different definition of it. I guess I don't know. I don't do a workshop in terms of having people come and, and participate in where the people actually do stuff at the same time. Um, I don't guess I'm technically doing workshops. I I do talks and presentations where I might, you know, talk about uh, go through how to do image processing and stuff like that. Uh, I'm usually up at, at NIAC, which is the imaging conference that's associated with NIF up in Suffern, New York. In the springtime, I, I, I'm kind of usually up there every year lately. Um, if they invite me back, you know, I'll be back next year. Um, I'm going to be doing a talk uh, out at the Advanced Imaging Conference in San Jose in uh, October this year. Um, so uh, workshops in, in terms of like, uh, like getting out under the sky and uh, having a small group of people, like say five or six people, where everybody is, you know, doing the same thing and and actually working, which is what I consider a workshop. It's it's difficult for me to do on the East Coast because of the weather. It's not like being out west where you got 300 clear nights a year. I mean, if if I tried to do a workshop, say up at up at Black Forest, um, and people pay money to go. There and it's it's a big effort, bunch of effort to get there and you know you got a better than 50/50 chance of it being cloudy. It's it's tough. It's really tough to do a workshop on the East Coast. So a true workshop, I I, I really don't haven't been doing those. Um, I generally give talks and image process on image processing and, and image acquisition. Um, so I don't know if you call it if you'd call it a workshop though. Next question is, any suggestions for DSLR lenses? Yeah, um, start out with the one that you get with the camera. Try it. Make sure you've got it focused correctly uh, on infinity so you can, you know, make sure you, you're getting a good uh, image to judge it by. And then shoot it wide open and then stop it down a stop and uh, stop it down another stop and stop it down three stops and compare the images that you're getting in the center and the corners of the field so that you know what it's going to give you and what you're willing to put up with in terms of the aberrations on the lens. So start, start out with what you have. And then most of the DSLRs come with uh, something like an 18 to 55 millimeter zoom lens. And uh, I, I, if you have a can, and I, I think they're remarkably good for how inexpensive they are, and sh I mean sh almost shockingly good for ast astrophotography. Now the Nikon's, I don't know how good they are because I haven't used those, but um, if you have that kind of wide-angle lens, then the next lens you probably want to get is going to be a 50 millimeter lens. And Nikon and Canon both make what they call nifty 50s. That's just a nickname for them, but they're 50 millimeter f 1.8 lenses. And um, that's a reasonably fast lens, but the best thing about it is that they're reasonably inexpensive. You can probably get those for around $150 to $200. And um, that will let you shoot, um, get a little bit tighter on stuff. Of course, the tracking is going to be more critical then. You, you certainly can use it on something simple like a barn door tracker or an ioptron. And um, we'll, we'll give you really nice pictures of stuff like uh, Milky Way areas like um, the North America Nebula and that area in Cygnus um, with uh, around uh, Seder, Gamma Cygnus, that area. And um, you can shoot dark nebula like Gelasia and Teal 3, which is nearby there, and those beautiful areas in Sagittarius with just that 50 millimeter lens. So if you have a wide angle that came with, with the, the camera, the next lens you, you probably want to look at getting is a 50 millimeter. And then from there, and the Canon and Nikon both make those, they're both inexpensive and they both work pretty well, but you need to stop them down. They don't work real great wide open, but no fast wide angle lenses really do. Um, and then you want to maybe move up to a good bit more focal length. I would recommend moving up to either 180, 180 millimeters or 200 millimeters. Um, Nikon makes the 180 and Canon makes the 200. They're both f2.8. So they're, they're nice, fast lenses. You can collect a lot of photons in a short amount of time. But um, f fast lenses usually start to get a little bit more expensive. So those lenses are both in the $800 to $1,000 range. 
Um, so they're going to be a little bit more sophisticated. Um, they're going to take great pictures because they frame a lot of stuff really well. Um, but you're going to need to have that on a more sophisticated mount too. It's probably a little bit too much lens for an iOptron Sky Tracker, so you need a, a, a better, bigger mount, and maybe piggyback it on top of a small refractor, and uh, you'll be able to do some really amazing work with it. The the other way you could go is uh, get a, depending on what kind of photography you want to do. If you want to do starscapes, where you combine Milky Way with interesting foregrounds, like if you live out west where the scenery is really interesting and you've got mountains to put in a foreground or something, you know, spectacular like uh, Grand Canyon or something like that. Or, you know, if you live in New Jersey and you've got this beautiful, incredible foreground scenery like the New Jersey Turnpike, um, you might want to get um, something like a really fast wide-angle lens. Like I just did a review of the Rokinon 16mm f2 lens and surprisingly enough it kind of ruins the rule about fast lenses don't work good wide open. Um, this one performs reasonably well wide open and I use it wide open all the time because it gathers more photons so you get a better picture uh, in a shorter amount of time. Um, so like the 16mm f2 is only made for APS C size sensors but this entire Rokinon lens line has a pretty good reputation for these new lenses that are extreme wide angles. They make a 14 millimeter f2.8, that's full frame, will cover even full frame camera. They also make a 16 millimeter f2, uh, which is the one that I reviewed, and they have something else that's crazy, it's even wider than that. It's either a 10 or a 12 millimeter f2, which I've seen people taking pictures with that seems to perform pretty well also. So in terms of lenses to, to add uh, to the one that you've already got that came with your camera, I would go 50 millimeter first, and then think about a 180, and then maybe think about a specialized super wide angle, super fast lens if you want to do starscapes or if they're, they're good for comets too. I'm sorry, not comets, meteors. Yeah, it's, I love that comment, New Jersey Turnpike. We... I don't know, we, we really appreciate our uh, landscapes on the East Coast, but they're not as dramatic as they are out West. Definitely not. Um, so I don't see any more questions in Q&A. You guys, this is your last call on that. Ask your questions or uh, forever hold your peace. Um, I, uh, and same goes for the guys in the room. Uh, while I have a sec, I do want to mention next week, uh, Peter Kalajian is going to be on on elements of flat fielding. Um, and then after that, we've got Anna Morris, and we've got something on remote imaging, and then we've got um, Josh speaking about uh, giving us an update as to what went on at Okitex. Uh, we've got a lot of stuff uh, coming up, so check our website. Um, you can always subscribe to us on YouTube to get our latest videos. Um, but if that does, if I don't get any more questions, I'm going to go back to Jerry. I'm going to give Jerry an opportunity to talk about, oops, something moved. Nope, didn't move. Uh, I'm going to give Jerry to talk about whatever it is, uh, even if it's just uh, his website where you can get his books or Support. like that. What are, what are your books, J.J. Terry? Well, um, I don't know. Just get out there and have fun. I try to go someplace dark. Um, the biggest uh, thing, tip I can give you is uh, taking these pictures is all about photons. And uh, the more photons you get, the better your images will be. That's probably one of the biggest mistakes that beginners make is that they just don't use exposures that are long enough. Look at the histogram on the back of the camera to judge your exposure. Make sure it's well separated from the left-hand side because that's where the noise lives. Um, make sure you, you expose long enough to get that histogram way over, uh, away from the left-hand side. And uh, uh, shoot and collect more photons. And then once you've got the correct exposure in a single image, then just shoot a bunch of those single images and start stacking them to improve the overall signal-to-noise ratio. And that's really... You know, deep sky images are all really about uh, signal-to-noise ratio. And a way to improve the signal-to-noise ratio, the noise is going to be kind of fixed. You can't really remove the noise. But you can reduce it in proportion to the signal that you gather. 
That's the secret is to get good signal to noise ratio. And the way to get good signal to noise ratio is by collecting more photo photons because the photons is what makes the signal. Um, and the only way to do that is by using longer exposures and collecting more exposures and stacking them. So that's the biggest tip that I can give you is you can make better pictures by collecting more photons. Um, come to my website at astropix.com, P-I-X, and uh, take a look around. I got a lot of information there that's uh, free you can take a look at uh, to get you started. And then if you want to get into it more, you can maybe take a look at my books. Um, and, uh, you know, drop me a line if you got any more questions. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you very much for coming on today. Uh, probably one of the best people on to have uh, to discuss uh, DSLR astrophotography. So again, thank you. And uh, guys out there, we'll see you next week. Um, and Jerry, before uh, I'm going to end this session, uh, but the people in the room are welcome to stay for a second. But thank you out there for coming.